At Family Church, we celebrate the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus uh, all the time, but once a month, we, we celebrate using the Lord's Supper and communion, and if you're watching us regularly online, I think it'd be a great idea if you would have a cracker and juice, or if you'd have some way that you can celebrate with us, so that in the service time, when we actually have communion, you can share that with us wherever you are. I hope you can do that today. I heard a statement as a young man that really riveted my attention and I absolutely believe to be true. Somebody said, your life is formed by the commitments you make and keep. That there's this intentional process that God's given us choices that we can make and your life is formed by those important commitments that you decide this is valuable, this is what I want, this is where I'm going and that you keep those commitments. I would add as a corollary, now that I'm a few years more down the road, your life is also deeply affected by the commitments you make and don't keep. And perhaps the one that's hidden is that your life is deeply affected by the commitments you don't make but should have. The commitments you've avoided, the commitments you've ducked. So we're talking about this subject of commitment, and it's at a very, very important subject in terms of our whole life, but particularly in terms of our relationship to God. And so I want to use an illustration from a wonderful piece of Northwest history that I enjoy, and that is the story of Lewis and Clark and their Shoshone guide, Sacagawea. And I have read, I think, three uh, stories, some of them fiction, some of them uh, biographies of, the, of Lewis and of Clark, and even a one from a point of view of one of their Indian guides. And it's an incredible thing that we often don't realize how important it is to us and how incredibly difficult it was. So in 1804, uh, President Jefferson said, I want to pick you, Meriwether Lewis, who was his secretary, to lead an expedition to go and try to find a passageway to the Northwest, to the, to the Pacific. And their picture was that you could go up the Mississippi and then the Missouri River, cross a little mountain, find a wide open plain, and this big river called the Columbia that went all the way to the other side, because they'd already been on the other side. They knew it came out. And so they had this idea that there was this Northwest Passage. And then they knew that there were all kinds of tribes of Native Americans there, and they wanted to set up relationships and connections with those. And, and so they, they set out on this incredible trek. Now, just for reference, realize that the vast majority of the United States citizens at this time lived within 50 miles of the Atlantic Ocean. Everything beyond 15 mile, or 50 miles was the West. Now, it's interesting, when we say the Midwest now, I think they've misunderstood what Midwest and what Mid means. But we were all this wild country out here that people didn't know what was there. They didn't know, they didn't have maps. They didn't know how far it was. They didn't know anything about it. And so they set out on this incredible, they call them the Discovery Corps. So this trek of discovery. They started at St. Louis, and they are supposed to be traveling across all of this country. And as you read through the stories, it's incredible the hardship that they went through. I mean, they had a 45-foot keelboat that weighed 10 tons, and they were going on the river. You think that wouldn't be too bad? Let me remind you, they were going upriver. They spent almost 2,000 miles pulling this huge boat up the river. Sometimes it was so steep and so swift that they had to have people pulling on the side while they pulled in the middle. And then they got to Great Falls, Montana, and they had to take all of their boats out, and they had to portage them 10 miles uphill, pushing them on roller logs to get to back to the river. And you start reading about the daily, I mean, they're going through incredible hardship. Their feet are sore. They had one guy die of an appendix attack. They had grizzly bears. They had some hostile native tribes. Most of them were friendly, but they had some, some fear for their lives kind of interactions. And then just the daily, get up after sleeping on the ground, eat a meal mostly of meat they were eating, and they're just trekking through. And, and finally they get to this place in, I think it's on the border of Montana now, called Lemhi Pass. And they climb up the first mountain after they've finished the river. 
And they're expecting to see this great plain where they can go. Now we can go downriver. And they saw mountains and mountains and mountains as far as their eye could see. And in that moment, they realized there was not a Northwest Passage. They were not going to find this great fabled thing that they had hoped. And if you imagine the discouragement that sets in, and then they're in the Bitterroot Mountains in the winter, and they haven't got anything to eat, and they're freezing, and they're trying to, they're actually eating their horses at times, and, they're, and you're reading through it in the book, and you're going, I just got to get through this place. I'm, I'm feeling cold and hungry. I mean, this is, this is incredible. And you know, as I'm reading through that, I'm thinking, how many days would I last under this kind of duress? I mean, they went through incredible hardship. They finally get out here to the coast. They camped at Fort Clatsop. They said something about the winter being raining all the time. It was kind of a depressing time. And then they head back. And they have to cover. Now they know where they're going. And they get to places where there are three rivers in Montana, and they don't know which way to go, and they have to explore every one. They have no idea what they're doing. And I think, how many people today would make even half that trek? And the reality is, when they came back, they finally got back to St. Louis. They had traveled 8,000 miles. They had cataloged 175 new animals and plants. They had met all kinds of different Indian tribes. They had mapped the whole area. And they finally came back. And they came back to a great celebration. They couldn't believe that out of all that had gone, only one person had died, that they, they got back. And they were celebrated because they had succeeded in this incredible trek. And you see, I think what a picture that is of commitment. That they had been given a grand picture of what they were going to do with their lives. And they spent two and a half years walking, riding, pulling 8,000 miles, living through incredible hardships. And they got back and there was a celebration and they were escorted up to the Washington, D.C. and met Thomas Jefferson and shared with him the journals and the things that they had gone through. And I think what a picture of our life here on earth, that we've been given an incredible possibility of living our lives here in connection with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and, and doing his work and discovering his work and what he wants us to do. And there's so many places to get discouraged and to get stopped and to get distracted from what we're doing. And so as we talk about this idea of commitment, I, I think of the, the only physical reminder of their journey was William Clark carved his name in a rock in a place called Pompey's Pillar. And that showed that they were there and they went through that period of time. But as we talk about what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus, I, I want to bring you to a, a stark question. Because when Jesus was here on earth, there were periods of time when he became very, very popular. If you can imagine, feeding 5,000 people with a couple of loaves of bread and fish, healing lepers, healing people that were filled with demons, walking on water, you know, you could kind of see that people would all of a sudden get really excited about seeing who he was. And so Jesus attracted a whole lot of fans. But there's a world of difference between fans and followers. And there were people that wanted to come and just see what he would do. Hey, what's the greatest new trick Jesus is going to do? And whenever the crowd got too big, it seemed like Jesus would lean in and he would say some really hard things. And I believe that why he did it was he was thinning out the crowd. He was saying, are you a fan or are you going to be a follower? I believe that Jesus is still doing the same thing. There are lots of people that want to come to church and have a good experience and have their life enhanced and maybe it'll help my kids and who knows what good could come. And Jesus calls us to a deeper commitment. And I think what a perfect time of year at the beginning of the year to say, what is my commitment level to Jesus like? And I don't know about you, but I need it stirred up because my commitment, it waxes and wanes. It goes up and down. And I need to be challenged again about who I am and why I'm here and what I'm doing. And is my life matching up with what I say? Let me read these words to you in Luke chapter 14. We're going to start in verse 23. It says, Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. That was the popular part. And turning to them, he said, 
If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. And then he gives two illustrations. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying this person began to build and one's name will finish. There's a whole lot of starts without a lot of finishing here. And then he says, well, suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Wouldn't he first sit down and consider with, whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he'll send a delegation while the other is still a long ways off. And we'll ask him for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Amen. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It's thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. You see, every now and then Jesus would make statements like that. That this isn't just a sideshow. I'm not just doing tricks for the public. I'm calling you to follow me. I'm calling you to surrender your life. I'm calling you to realize that my cause is the greatest cause in the world. And so I'm challenging you. Are you a fan or are you a follower? And when he would do that, the scripture clearly says some people leave. Some people were like, I'm out of here. That's too much for me. And at one point when he had said that his disciples needed to eat his flesh and drink his blood and they, they thought he was talking about cannibalism or something strange and instead of understanding what it meant to participate in the sacrifice of Christ. And, and he looked at his disciples and he said, are you going to leave too? And they said, where else would we go? For you have the words of life. You see, they were uncomfortable staying there because the commitment call was too strong for them. But when faced with the alternative of walking away from Jesus, they said, there's no way. We don't get all that you're doing and we don't understand and we are not capable of the kind of commitment you're asking for. But where else would we go? And I think that's where we come to when God asks us for greater commitment. As we say, I don't know if I've got the, the ability to commit at that kind of level. But where else do we go? Because Jesus is a great Savior. Jesus is the only Savior. And so let's look at what those commitments mean. He says, if you come to me and don't hate your father and mother and wife and children, and clearly he's not talking about being hateful towards your family. Because the scripture is full of our obligations to love each other deeply and to love that love needs to be at home. But what he's saying is your love for me compared to the love that you have for your family, it needs to be so much higher that commitment to me that it seems like this is almost hate. And I think that's a relevant message because a lot of people say, well, you know, religion is good. It kind of builds your family. And we're looking for the, the benefit of following Jesus. And there are many, many benefits. But let me tell you, your family cannot make you happy. Your family certainly can't forgive your sins and your family certainly can't give you eternal life. And you see, part of the problem in the day that Jesus was speaking to is they were raised in a context of multiple gods. You had a whole god shelf. You put all kinds of different gods up there and you worshipped whoever your favorite was for the day. And so for them to see Jesus as God, it was a great temptation for them to just add Jesus to their god shelf. We'll worship Jesus and Venus and Mars and whatever. And Jesus said, that's not how it works. If you put Jesus on your God shelf, you clear the shelf. And your family is there for you to love and to serve and to pour your life into, but they cannot be your God. You can't live for your family. Ultimately, when you live for Christ, you will have much to give to your family. But when you're trying to get your meaning for life from your family, you will inevitably find it a shallow well. <clears throat> And it becomes idolatry very easily. You see, he's asking us for a deep commitment. He says, you're going to love me more than you love your family. And he talks about counting the cost and looking at what it is required of someone who is going to be called a disciple of Jesus. 
And you know, I think of myself at age five and I gave my life to Jesus. I had no idea what the cost was. Which is why there are many, many points in your life when you are challenged again. Do you follow Jesus with everything you've got or are you going to bail out? Because you have to keep reaffirming and listen carefully. I believe you have to keep deepening your commitment to Christ. Because the more you understand, the more you have an opportunity. Do I trust you in this? Am I giving you my life in this? Do I believe that you have the words of life? And then he goes on and he says, whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Well, the cross is a picture of death. It wasn't a picture of Jesus' death at that point. It was a picture of somebody who had been sentenced to be crucified and they were carrying a part of their cross, taking it out to the hill where they were going to be dead within hours. So when you see somebody carrying a cross, it means their life is already over. And he said, you're willing to give up your life for me. I was watching a video this last week that was very impacting. It's about a new revival that is happening in a most unlikely place, and that is in the country of Iran, one of the most militant Islamic countries in the world. And there is a movement of God calling people to himself, and a lot of them are women. And they are coming out in hidden ways to share with other people about Jesus and to follow him and they live at great threat to their life and one of the the parts of the film that just rocked me they were of course not giving their face they were masked and their voices were masked and they were sharing their stories and this one woman said we know that if they come after us for being Christians that first they will rape us and then they will beat us and then they will kill us she said we know that and she says every morning When we walk out of our door, I think to myself, this may be the last day I'll be here. But I'm willing to follow Jesus in spite of that. You see, one of the ways that you tell what your commitment level is, is what does it take to stop you? What does it take to discourage you? What does it take to distract you? And I think of one of the sad things about the film is some of them had escaped from Iran because of the persecution, they'd come to America. And they were so disappointed with the lukewarm commitment of the churches. So disappointed with the, the Christians here who said they, you know, I'll, I'll show up at church if, if it's convenient and if the game's not playing and if there's not something else I want to do and if I'm not on vacation. And, and one of the families actually said they wanted to go back to Iran where things were real and they could follow Jesus. And I don't know what that says to you, but man, that that challenges me. You see, a couple years ago, we had a guy here who was upset at the church, and he was out picketing the church for a couple of weekends with big signs, with Nazi symbols, and et cetera. And you know, some people quit coming to church because they were uncomfortable and they were fearful. And I thought, I'm afraid we are lightweight Christians. What does it take to stop us? What does it take to discourage us? What does it take to get us off track? And I believe at those moments, you get challenged, and you say, wow, Do I love Jesus more than my own life? Do I have that kind of commitment? Am I willing to make that kind of commitment? And then he says in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. It's like, oh, wow, now he's talking about my stuff. Now he's talking about my my possessions. And it's nothing, there's nothing wrong with the fact that God has given us our cars and our homes and our health and great, great possessions. But let me warn you, we live in a materialistic culture where people live for their toys and it affects us. It begins to worm its way into our heart. And I know for me, the longer I own stuff, the greater the temptation is for it to own me. And I I begin to get my fingers wrapped around it and I hang on to it and I cling to it. And I think that God says, I'm giving you stuff, it's a great blessing, but hold it with an open hand. Because if I want to take it or if I want you to use it for me in a way that that I need it, then you've already said yes. Because he says I have to love him more than my stuff. Reminds me of a story, which is an impacting story in my own life. There was about two uh, guys that were in their 60s that were riding a train in France. And as they were riding along, one of the guys had a grand mal seizure, and he began 
shaking, and finally he fell to the floor, and his buddy came over, and he put something in his mouth to keep him from biting his tongue, and he, he took care of him, and, and the seizure was over after a short time, and, and he helped him get up, and he gave him his seat so that he could lie out because he was exhausted. And so he sat in a different place, and there was a woman there who spoke English, and she said to him, is that your brother? And he said, oh, no, we're not related. That's just my friend. And she said, and you take care of him? Oh, yeah, he said, um, you know, we kind of were in the, in the military together, and then we sort of kept track of each other over the years, and then I heard that he was having these difficulties, and there was nobody to take care of him. So I sold my home in the U.S., and I came over here to take care of him. And she said, wow, that's, that's an incredible sacrifice for you to give up your life and to come take care of him. Oh, no, he said, you don't understand. He said, we were in Vietnam together. And he said, we were caught in a firefight and I got shot. And he said, our whole core was, was ambushed. And, and there was a helicopter out there several hundred yards away ready to rescue us, but we couldn't get there. And they were trying to get everybody that was wounded. And finally, I told my buddy, just go. Save your own life. I'm done. And he said, I am not leaving you here. And he said, he grabbed me behind my neck. And he said, he drug me through the jungle. And he carried me when he had to. And he got me to that helicopter. And I got to a hospital and it saved my life. He said, so when you think I made a sacrifice, you don't understand, my life ended 40 years ago if it weren't for his intervention in my life. And see, I think this is the point. He said, after all that he did for me, there's nothing I wouldn't do for him. And when you look at the idea of commitment, it sounds stark and harsh and tough and over my head. But when I think of what a great Savior we have and what he's done for us and how he came from heaven and came and locked himself into a human body and he lived on our cruddy planet and then he laid down his life so that you and I could have life eternal. Then he walks with us. He gives us his spirit. He, he manages our life and he has a plan for us and a purpose and a destiny. And when you think of all that he's done for me, that kind of commitment is normal. You see, after what he's done, that's what I want to do. And so I think we have to have that balance, that understanding of how great it is of what God has done for us that then compels me to say, God, I want to love you more than my family, more than my stuff, more than my life. When we say we give our lives to Jesus, it's not a figure of speech. It's a real-time commitment that needs to be reaffirmed regularly. And you know, I, I think as a nation, we are getting commitment shy. In fact, I, I hear a lot of knocks, even on younger generation of the millennials and the Gen Z, saying they're not really institutionally loyal. They don't stay at their jobs. They don't commit to things. They don't join teams. They just want everything to be about them. And I'm not sure if that's young or if that's old as well. I think it's easy for us to be committed to myself and not anything else. But you know what I believe? I believe that young people are looking for a cause more than they're looking for anything else. To save the planet or save the animals or save the whales or save something. And we need to help them see that the church is not an organization to belong to. It's a cause to live for. And you know where they need to see it? And the people that are older than them who are living out of cause and not looking for a way to have commitment light. So, maybe we're looking for a church like this. It's called the Light Church. It says 24% fewer commitments, home of the 7.5% tithe. We only have 15-minute sermons, 45-minute worship services, we only believe in eight commandments, your choice. <laughs> we use three spiritual laws, and we have an 800-year millennium. That's more funny to the theologians than it is to everybody else. <laughs> Everything you wanted in a church and less. You see, I don't know if one of the reasons you came to church was to be challenged, to be deepened, to be stretched, or did you come to be entertained and to be made feel good and to have your family enhanced and to have your life enhanced and, and to have good things for you? 
And both can be true. But I think there's a temptation in us to either make, not to make a commitment or to make a commitment and begin to coast. Begin to become complacent. Begin to lean back. And I, I was thinking of the Apostle Paul. And, and when the Apostle Paul was at the end of his life, he challenged people to not live in the past, but to press toward the future. I'm not saying these things about commitment because I'm angry or concerned with family church. I honestly see some wonderful things going on. We have more people in life groups than we've had for years. We've got people that are in leadership training. We've got people that are stepping up to help with grief care and with divorce care. And we've got people that are meeting in discipleship. We've got guys that are getting free of pornography. We've got, we got a lot of wonderful things that are going on. And here's the point, is God can do more with a few committed people who are followers than with a thousand fans who are just curious. So the question is, is which group are you in? Are you a committed follower pouring your life out for Jesus, or are you uh, coming to see if there's a good show this weekend, coming to see if there's something for you, coming to have your ears tickled? And I think those are challenging questions, and one of the encouraging things that I know is people's giving reflects a lot about their spiritual priorities. And over this fall, we challenged you probably more than we ever have to do the Christmas boxes, the Operation Christmas Child boxes. We had 855 of them, more than we've ever had before. And those went to the Philippines, I think, mostly, which is keep praying for those, that God will use those. And then we did the blessing tree for our own local needs in our community. And there were 21 families helped with over 500 gifts because of your generosity. You know people took tags and brought back extra stuff? They put what was on the tag and they brought something extra. And then we put out this challenge and said, you know, at the end of the year, we want to honor God with not only giving to him at this time when we're remembering his birth, but we want this building to be made in such a way that it can be a, a worship center for the next 20 years. And we want to give something to the Safe Haven Maternity Home. We want to help them. It was a local group helping our community. And I have the privilege to announce to you that we set the target out there at $50,000 after all this giving had gone on. And guess what happened? We received 57500 over this middle year. Yeah. Isn't that exciting? You know, individually, I can't do much, but together we can do quite a bit. And there's a part of powerful being a committed group together. And so at this beginning of the year, we're challenging you to step up your commitment. I want you to look at these statements by the Apostle Paul. He says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Just like Lewis and Clark said, President Jefferson gave us a duty. We were to go and explore this whole West, and we've come back, and we've done it. He says, in the same way, Christ Jesus took hold of me so that I could do a part of the cause that he's called us to, so I could be a part of that. And then he says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. He said, wow, this is the Apostle Paul. He's planted churches all over Asia Minor. He's been beaten. He's been shipwrecked. He's been in jail who knows how many times. And what's his message? I'm not there yet. And if the Apostle Paul wasn't there yet, are we? No. He says, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what lies ahead. There's a reason your rearview mirror is smaller than your windshield. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul had this very clear picture. He said, God has got a call on my life. He's called me to serve him. He's called me to pour out my life. And Paul had some very specific parameters that God had called him to. And my question for you is, what has God called you to? Are you living out that same plan? Because there's a terrible danger of having the arrival mindset. The arrival mindset is more dangerous the longer you're a Christian. Because instead of seeking God with all your heart and reading, because you don't know what's in the Bible, man, I never knew there was a book like that. That's cool. And then you get down the road and the 
good news becomes the old news. And when somebody starts talking about the gospel and how desperately sinful we are and how our flesh fights against the spirit and how Jesus saved us, you check out because it's like, eh, I already know that. And it's easy to say, well, I've served in the past and now it's time for me to coast. It's easy to get involved with so many good things that we forget great things. It's easy to live our life as though we're on vacation instead of on mission. And Paul said, at this point in my life, I believe it's a race and at the race you run faster at the end. I'm kicking towards the tape. God has a plan for me. And you know, when Lewis and Clark got back from their voyage, they came and there was a great fanfare because they had accomplished the impossible. And I think what Paul was looking forward to, and I hope what you're looking forward to, is someday when you cross that line, Jesus is going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Because you've taken what he's given you and you've invested in things that will last forever. I, I do a, a fair number of funerals. And you know, I tell you, every time I'm at a funeral, I am impacted by the fact that so much of what we worry about doesn't matter at all. And what we often put off is what really is important. And so many things that we worry about and stress about and work on, nobody even remembers. And the few things that you do that invest in people's lives and invest in eternity, those never go away. And Paul says, I'm waiting for this. I haven't arrived. I'm pressing on. I will continue to look towards that prize to where, with my very last breath, I will say, God, I'm still wanting to do what you've called me to. That's what it means to give your life for the cause of Jesus. And this next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about what does it mean? If I really know who Jesus is, then it's only normal that I would commit my life. He's the only one that can save us. He's the only one that has the plan for our lives. And if I'm committed to, his, to Christ, then I should be committed to his cause. I should be living on mission instead of on vacation. And if I'm committed to the cause of Christ, then I need to be committed to the community of Christ. It will show up in my connection to and my relationship and my involvement in the church. That's the visible, physical outpouring of my heart. So we're going to make some challenges about what does it take to keep you from coming to church? What does it take to keep you from committing? What does it take to keep you from serving? What does it take to keep you from giving? What, what is holding us back? And if Jesus were to be here today and he said, if you don't love me more than these, you can't be my disciple, then what choice would you make? I believe that there are people that come to church that have never become disciples of Jesus. They've never really said, I'm all in. I want to give you my life, Jesus. I want to live for you. I, I believe that you are the only answer to connecting with God, that you are the, the door to eternity, that you're the thing that will make life purposeful. And I'm going to live for that. And maybe today is an opportunity for you to do that. I'm going to hand off to the Green Campus and to South Umpqua and Pastor Will and Pastor Sky as you walk through this last part together. Love you guys. As you hear that message, and that's a tough message, and I have to tell you, I, I need this message as much as anyone. You see, that's the danger of arrival as a preacher begins to think he's talking to somebody else instead of himself. And I believe that my commitment level is at times very high, and sometimes it's not. And you say, well, Paul, you're involved in professional ministry. Yeah, it's so easy for it to become about success, or about how I did, or about how people respond, or numbers, or whatever. And you can lose your heart in the middle of the, of the ministry. So how easy it is to get distracted, or to get discouraged, or to get pulled aside. And I guess that's my question, is are you pressing are you pressing in your personal relationship with Christ? Are you pressing in terms of what he's called us to do? And it's really simple what he's called us to do, to glorify him in everything, to lead people where they come to Jesus, and to help people who are part of God's family to grow. It's really pretty simple. And every message we talk about is about usually one of those three things. And so this is a good time at the beginning of the year to look in your own heart and say, what's my commitment level? 
Do I understand who Jesus is? And have I made the commitment to him and to his cause and to his church? And what does it mean for me to step up? So the question to ask yourself is, where am I shallow? Where's my commitment thin? Is it about my stuff? Is it about my relationships, my family and friends? Is it about my my own personal life? And am I willing to say, God, whatever it takes, I'm going to step up. And I I left this blank intentionally because I believe that the answer to this question has to come from the Holy Spirit to your heart. And for some of you, it may be simple as I'm going to give my life to Christ and I've never really done that. Paul, I've never heard it explained so clearly that it's all or nothing. And coming to that choice today, I want to give my life to Christ completely. And for maybe some of you, this is the very first time you've said, I'm all in. And in the quietness of this moment, you can just commit your life to Christ and say, God, take, take my life. For some of you, it may be how often you come to church and you just are here if it works out and if it doesn't, it's no big deal. And your commitment needs to, to step up. And for some of you, it's about something God's calling you to do and you've been afraid or you've been hesitant. I don't, I don't know what the answer to that question is, but God does. And I believe that he looks at each one of us and he says, are you willing to follow me or do you want to just be a fan? So we're preparing for a time of communion and celebrating the gift of Christ to us. And you come up and you take that cracker and that juice and it's a reminder that the freedom and the life that I have in Jesus cost him everything. And I hope that in communion that, that gratitude wells up in you that says, after all he's done for me, there's nothing I wouldn't do for him. You see, a life of obligation is terrible. A life of gratitude is wonderful. And so we come back and we remember. And so if you're sitting down here in the lower area, just come up the diagonal and take your elements and go back and sit down and then just take a moment and reflect on what does it mean to me that Jesus loves me and that he's forgiven me and that he's committed to me and how committed am I to him. And just take that as a time of worship. If you're sitting in the balcony, it'll be served to you. And just whenever you're ready, you can eat or drink in the name of Jesus. And if you're here today and you haven't yet made that commitment, We're glad you're here. This is awesome. This is where you learn about Jesus. And don't just come up and take communion just because other people are doing it. This is not a peer pressure thing. This is a personal, I am committing my life to Jesus again kind of moment. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the challenges that come to us. Thank you for the fact that we need stirred up and we need to think about reality again. God, our lives get so full and so frenetic that we often live unexamined lives. We don't know who we are and we don't know where we're going and we certainly don't know why. So Father, take us back to the basics of who you are and what you've done for us and what does it mean for us to give ourselves completely to you. And God, it's so easy for us to become selfish and to become isolated and to become materialistic and to, to have other gods on the God shelf. God, we come today at the beginning of the year and say we want to we want to clear the shelf and we want to put you back in the center. We want to make you the center of our lives. And God, may 2020 be a year in which we see you do amazing things in Douglas County. And you've put us in a place, God, where there's a lot of darkness, a lot of abuse, a lot of drugs, a lot of lostness. And God, thank you that we get to be the light in a place where it's needed. That we get to be a church that can point people towards you we get to be a community together sharing your love. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're watching online, either because you're sick and can't make it or out of town, or maybe you watch online regularly, let me invite you to, while we are celebrating communion here at Family Church, to take and take a few moments and celebrate communion right there in your own home, if you're able, or wherever you might be. And I'm going to walk through a little bit of a teaching on it and just kind of help us understand it. But if you have a possibility of going and getting a cup, um, picking up some crackers, a loaf of bread, something that you can take and physically 
participate in this as we go through the process, it will be meaningful to you. And how you get the elements and what you put them in and if it's grape juice or wine or whatever you want to take, it's, those, those details really are not the point of it. The point of it is this is a spiritual exercise of, of examining ourselves, of reviewing what the truth is, and, the, and, and it's a spiritual moment that the scripture speaks of very highly. And so I'd like to lead you through that um, wherever you are right now. And if you have somebody or if you're able to, to go ahead and grab some crackers and grab some juice, then when we get to the end of this, we'll have an opportunity for you just to take a few moments as we are here at Family Church and celebrate what Jesus has done for us. So I'd, I'd like to read, first of all, from 1 Corinthians 11. And Paul is writing to a church that's actually doing it all wrong, and he's kind of trying to correct them, and so he brings in some things to, to bring this back to a point of worship. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. So Paul wasn't there. He didn't come to be a follower of Jesus till after that. And so evidently Jesus had communicated to him that this is how he was supposed to, to remember that what had happened. And so he, Paul, like us, wasn't there in person. So this is his way of reviewing and remembering that. And so it says, Jesus broke the bread and then he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. To proclaim is to, to share something as true and to, to again review it and remember that. And so he's saying whenever you go through this exercise, you are reminding yourself, you are saying, wow, this is what happened. And, and Jesus' body was broken for me and, and his blood was shed for me. And I am now a part of the family of, of God. I am now forgiven. I am now included because of what Jesus has done. And then he goes on and gives a little warning. He said, So then, whoever eats the body or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. So everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. And, he, and he's dealing with a situation where they actually had a whole love fest, a, a big feast, and, and some people were coming, and they were hungry, and they were elbowing their way in, and they were getting a lot, and it, it turned into a... a a kind of a wild party. And he was saying, man, that is dangerous. You've forgotten what this is about. But, but it's also a great reminder for you and I that before we take this moment and remember Jesus in this special way, he says, we're supposed to examine ourselves. What, what is my relationship with Christ like? Is there any sin? And I, and I think it's often appropriate just to stop and to pray and to say, God, is there anything in my life that's hindering you working? Is there, is there anybody I've offended? Is there anything that I, maybe it's a sin you clearly know that you committed and you just need to confess it. And, and maybe you think, I, I don't really think of anything that I've done specifically that was an act of sin. But you allow the Holy Spirit to point out where you've been selfish or where you've been misusing the, the resources God's given you or something that the Spirit points out. And that's that's part of the function of not only examining yourself, as it says, but, but doing that and letting God examine you. And so there's that moment of, of kind of humility and of, of prayer and of asking God to show you and, and offering up and saying, God, thank you that your, your blood is sufficient to cover that sin too. I, I confess, I, I blow it all the time. I'm, I'm a sinful person. And thank you, God, for forgiving me. And, and, and you go through a period of time and examine and, and confess and, and kind of like clear the plate. And I, I think it's impor important for us to do that daily, but it seems like when we celebrate communion, there's kind of a, a big moment where you're saying, okay, I want to clear my heart. And then, and then he says, we are to remember the body and blood of Christ. And I, and I think as you go through and as you take that bread, you, you think about cross. You think about Jesus saying, not my will, but yours be done. And, and about his body that was he was whipped and he has the crown of thorns and, and not to become gruesome or to focus on the gory part of it, but, but to realize that it, the cost that it was for him. This, this is a free gift for me, but wow, the cost was incredible. And, and, and when you think of the blood and 
the fact that it was shed for me, that that's the only way that sin is forgiven. In, in the Old Testament, it was a lamb that was killed and the, the, the throat was slit and the blood was put on the altar and that was a picture of the cost of sin. And so as you remember those things, you, you come to that moment of not only soberness, but it's, it's, we call it a celebration because you're thinking, wow, this is so incredible. And so you take that and, and then I encourage you and, I, and I'd like to just pray with you. And then when we're done praying, whenever you're ready, you, you take that bread and you take that cup and you say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I, I remember you, I take this. And you, you eat the bread and drink, the, drink from the cup and, and let it be a, a spiritual moment for you. So I'd like to lead you in prayer. And um, if, if you'd like to spend a few moments after that, uh, examining your heart and seeing if God would show you anything that you need to confess and then and then go ahead and eat and, and drink whenever you're ready. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for those who are joining us online. And, and Father, all of us have things in our life where selfishness comes in and where bitterness comes and where, where we allow fear to control us instead of you. And I ask that you would just lead us, God, to confess whatever it is that might hinder our relationship or you working in us. And then I ask that as we eat this piece of bread, a cracker, as we drink this juice or this wine, that, that we would do it as an act of worship, remembering and reminding ourselves how valuable and how important this is and, and saying how grateful we are to you. But God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for giving us this, this symbol to remind us because we are a forgetful people. In your precious name. Now, as the music continues, just go through that process wherever you are in that, and we'll trust that this will be a special part of your worship today. Thank you.